Tom's Midnight Garden by Philippa Pierce. Dramatized for radio by Judy Allen. Episode 1. just arrived. I have to go now. Tom! Where are you? Uncle Alan's here. I don't want to go to Uncle Alan and Aunt Gwen's. I don't think they've even got a garden. I want to stay here and build our tree house. Tom! Oh, you know you mustn't go near Peter. It's all right. I'm talking through the door. Pete, I'll write to you every day. Goodbye. Goodbye, Tom. Tom! Come in. I am sorry, Tom. We don't want to send you away. Your father and I will miss you. And so will poor Peter. But it's the only way to stop you getting the measles. It's all right. Tom, do remember you'll be a visitor. And, oh, Tom, do try to be good. Alan, we're so grateful to you and Gwen for taking Tom at such short notice. Oh, we're glad to help out. <coughs> I expect we'll get on reasonably well, <coughs> won't we, Tom? Yes, Uncle Alan. Goodbye, Tom. Give my love to Auntie Gwen. Tom? It's much bigger than our house. <laughs> yes, but it isn't a whole house any longer. It was converted into flats some years ago. Ah, oh, there's your aunt. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> come on in. Uncle Alan will bring you a cake. Yes. Let me give you a welcome kiss. <laughs> Tom, it's lovely to have you here. How is Peter. Oh, I hope you're not going to be too bored. Our flat is very small. Oh, what's that door at the back of the hall? Have you got a garden after all? Oh, I'm afraid not, Tom. Just a sort of backyard, very pokey, with rubbish bins, nowhere to play. Did you have a good journey? We came through Ely. Tom wanted to climb the cathedral tower. I had to tell him it was out of the question while he's in quarantine for measles. But I bought him a postcard, didn't I, Tom? Uh, yes, thank you. We've got a grandfather clock. It isn't ours. It belongs to old Mrs. Bartholomew. It's incredible. It is also utterly unreliable. You will notice, Tom, that it struck one, despite the fact that it is now five o'clock. Don't, no, don't touch it, Tom. Mrs. Bartholomew is very particular about her clock. If she's so particular about it, why doesn't she have it in her flat with her? Because it's screwed to the wall at the back. The screws have all rusted in. Keeps good enough time, but seldom chooses to strike the right hour. <clears throat> Our flat is up here. I've never seen inside a grandfather clock. Now, Tom, don't try and open it. <laughs> its voice is so penetrating, I can even hear it in bed at night. Its voice? I mean, of course, its chime. Come away from it, Tom. Come up and have tea. Here we are. This is our flat. Mrs. Bartholomew lives up those stairs in the attic flat. Mm. Come inside, Tom dear. I'm sorry I snapped at you, but you see, Mrs. Bartholomew owns the whole house. She's our landlady, so we don't want to do anything to annoy her. Now, this is your bedroom. There are bars across the bottom of the window. I'm not a baby. They're not for you, Tom. This window had bars across it when we moved in. The bathroom window has them too, for that matter. See, I've put flowers on your chest of drawers. And here are some books for you to read. School stories for girls. 
They were mine when I was a child. Now, I've got a nice tea ready for you. I'm a good cook and I'm going to spoil you for food. Dear Peter, this card is a picture of the Cathedral Tower at Ely. Uncle Alan wouldn't let me climb it. Uh, the house here is flats and there isn't any garden. Ugh, I can hear Uncle Alan through the wall having his bath. There is a clock here that strikes wrong. It says it's three, but really it's six. I don't know what I'll do all day. Dear Peter, I hate it here. It's the worst hole I've ever been in. I don't know what to write to you about. Every day is the same. I can't go out. I can't even answer the door to the milkman in case I give him the measles. I'd do anything to get out of it. To be somewhere else. Anywhere. I can't sleep. I could go and see if there's something to eat. Mm. Biscuits? No, but I don't want a biscuit. Um. Oh no! So, what are you doing in the kitchen? What is it? Are you hungry? <laughs> Speaking as someone who has watched him at meal times, I hardly think so. No, I was just bored. I couldn't sleep. I'm sorry about the cup. It's all right. It isn't broken. All the same, Tom, there must be no more of this. You must understand you are not to put your light on once it has been turned out. Nor equally are you to get out of bed. Not even to get up in the morning. Now, don't be silly. But you are not to get up otherwise. Not even if I need to. Badly. <clears throat> of course, you must go to the uh, lavatory, but uh, you will go straight back to bed afterwards. A child of your age needs ten hours sleep. Yes, so you go to bed at nine in the evening and you do not get up until seven in the morning. It is for your own good time. You understand? Yes. Now, I want you to promise to observe our wishes. Will you promise, Tom? I suppose so. Yes. Good. I knew I could reason with you. Now, back to bed, young man. But all the same, I won't sleep. <sighs> Three. Four. It's one o'clock. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Why don't you strike one? Ten. Like the clock at home. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Thirteen. I have to write this by torchlight because Uncle Alan says I mustn't put on the light. The clock has just struck thirteen. It often strikes the wrong hour, but they've always been real hours. If the clock has made an extra hour, I could be in bed for ten hours and have the extra hour for myself. I could get up without breaking my promise. But there can't really be a thirteenth hour, can there? I'm going to see what the clock fingers say. I'm going down to the hall. Oh. It's too dark to see the clock face. I can't even find a light switch. I'll have to open the back door and let in the moonlight. They lied to me. There is a garden at the back. There's a lawn with daffodils in the grass and a huge fir tree and yew trees, all different shapes. I've never climbed a yew tree before. 
Peter, it's a really big garden. I'm going to go out there and play tomorrow, whatever they say. Someone's coming. It's only a girl. Hello? Hello? She didn't seem to see me. Why didn't she see me? The hall's changed. It's full of different stuff, big old furniture. There's one of those weather things on the wall. A barometer, I think. A tiger skin rug. She's coming back. She's old fashioned too. I think she's a maid. I lit the fire in the parlor. She's gone. She just faded away. All the old fashioned things are fading. The hall's normal again. I don't understand. I wasn't dreaming. And I wasn't scared, so it can't have been ghosts. The only thing that didn't change was the clock. But I forgot to see what time it said. Why did they lie to me about the garden? Have you had enough cereal, Tom? Uh, yes, thank you. Aunt Gwen, do you believe lying is wrong? Oh, Tom, always. But do you think some special lies might be all right? Sometimes. Uh, you are asking if lying is ever justifiable. Hmm? I suppose you're thinking of what are commonly known as white lies. Well, not exactly. I mean, what if someone is kept in the dark about something he'd enjoy because other people didn't want to tell him about it? Supposing some people actually said the thing wasn't there because they didn't want the bother of the first person using it. <laughs> what kind of thing was it? The second people didn't want the first people to know about and use. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the thing is, Gwen. Uh, if I understand Tom correctly, some person or persons were lying simply for their own convenience and to the harm of another person or persons. Yes. I, I wondered if you thought that kind of lie might be all right. <clears throat> it would be utterly and obviously unjustifiable. I'm surprised you have any doubts. <laughs> Well, it's time I was off. <sighs> now, I wonder where I put my umbrella. Never mind, Tom. Uncle Alan has a very highly developed sense of right and wrong. So do I. Aunt Gwen, it was kind of you to put flowers in my room when I came. I'm so glad you liked them. It would have been nice if you could have picked them from a garden of your own. Yes, but there isn't a garden to this house, of course. <laughs> no. What do you mean by that, Tom? Wouldn't it be nice if there was a garden at the back? It would be nice if we had wings and could fly. Suppose you could walk out of the door at the back this very minute and pick daffodils. I should be very surprised to find a daffodil anywhere outside now. Why? It's too late in the summer. Daffodils don't flower out of doors at this time of the year. I I'm going downstairs. What for? Nothing special. Don't go this morning. This is the morning Mrs. Bartholomew goes downstairs to wind the grandfather clock. She doesn't like to be disturbed and we don't want to get on the wrong side of her. It's all right. I won't bother her. The garden is there. Oh, it has to be. Hello. Who are you? Are you come to help me clean my sparklets? Where's the garden? Whoop! Don't fall over the dustbins. I'm afraid this yard's the nearest thing we have to a garden. You're the boy who's staying in the first floor front, aren't you? Do you live in the ground floor flat? Yeah. Are you alright? Do you have a maid who lights your fire for you? What? <laughs> I even have to mend my own car. Are you interested in engines? And there really isn't a garden. <laughs> nope. Just this yard. What on earth's the matter? I'm, I'm all right. But, but wait, wait. Don't go in yet. Listen. What is it? It's old Ma Bartholomew coming to wind her precious clock. You don't want to run into her. There have never been children here. She might not like it. Uh, thank you for warning me. Um, those little gardens over the back fence. Uh, and what about them? Well, that one with the tree in it. That's an old yew tree, isn't it? 
I'm afraid I don't know much about trees. I've seen a tree like that before. Uh, is she still in the hall? Oh, I have a look. No. She's on her way upstairs again. You're safe. Dear Peter, the gardener's gone. There's a yard instead, and some little houses. But I'm sure one of the trees is still there, over the fence in one of the little gardens at the back. It's a link, and the clock is a link. I've looked at the clock properly now. It hasn't got thirteen numbers, just twelve. There's a picture on the face. It's strange, but sort of interesting. It's a man with a gold face and enormous wings. He's holding a book, but I can't see the name of it. Uncle Alan and Aunt Gwen have gone to bed. I'm waiting till I'm sure they're asleep. Then I'm going down to the yard. Burn after reading. Even raining, it, it, it must be dew. <laughs> I don't leave any footprints. The sun is just coming up. I can see it through the trees. It's making something shine over there, behind all the ferns. Pond, and round here, this must be a vegetable garden. Oh, a piece of paper. It's a note to Oberon, king of the fairies. Well, Oberon, I'll leave it there for you. Footprints. Those weren't there when I came out. A door's opening in the wall. Someone's coming. It's only a gardener. He hasn't seen me. He's going the other way. Oh, that's a sundial right up there. I've never seen one on the wall. The sun's just reached it, but I don't know how it tells the time. If it's morning out here, it may be morning in the flat. Oh, Gwen and Uncle Alan could be getting up. I ought to get back. There are daffodils, but Aunt Gwen doesn't know about them. She doesn't know about the garden at all. She wasn't really lying to me. I don't want to leave it, but I can come back tomorrow night. I can come back every night. You and Peter get on very well, don't you, Tom? I expect you're missing him a lot. I write to him every day. Unfortunately, since he has the measles, he can't write back. <laughs> and writing to him isn't the same as being able to play with him and talk to him. I do talk to him, in a way, in my head. Are you saying you're in a telepathic communication? What's that? <laughs> Direct communication between one mind and another, without the use of any other medium, such as the written word. Oh, um. Well, I don't know about that. I just, well, I just sometimes talk to Peter in my head. Well, I think that's very nice, dear. Peter, 
The season has changed again. It's different every time I come out here. It's gone back to summer now. The roses are out. There are poppies over there. It's been spring, summer, autumn, back to summer again. How can that be? I wish you could write back and tell me what you think. <sighs> Footsteps. I'm near that big wall with the door in it. There's nowhere to hide. Unless I can open the door. But I can't. Why can't I? The latch seems to go soft. Where are you? Uh, here. Abel? Where are you? Yes, Mrs. Melbourne. Abel! It's time this hedge were clipped. I'll see to that, Mum. Well, be sure that you do. Now, come with me, please. There's a shop over here. I want you to move. Peter, I've discovered something important. I'm definitely invisible in the garden. The gardener ignores me, and last night there was a fierce-looking woman in a long purple dress who looked right through me. And there's something else. I've climbed every tree in the garden now, but I still can't open doors. I keep trying, but I can't. My hand somehow goes through the latch. I've been thinking, if the latch isn't really solid, perhaps the door isn't either. Perhaps I could push myself right through it. Well, it could work, couldn't it? I'm going to try tonight. The gardener. Can I squeeze through the door after him? Oh, he's too quick. Perhaps if I just lean on the door and push, I'm going numb all down one side. No, no, I'm going through. I'm really going through. It feels very peculiar. My stomach's churning. I'm scared to push my head through. But what if I get stuck halfway? Oh, I've done it. And there's the gardener. He's got his sandwiches. He's shutting his eyes. For all good things I thank the Lord. And may he keep me from all the works of the devil that he hurt me not. Oh, same grace for his sandwiches. When he goes back in the garden, I have to sneak through behind him. I don't want to push through a door again. Tom, dear... Are you very bored staying with us? Oh, oh, no. I'm not bored. I worry that there isn't enough to interest you here. Oh, well, there is. Uh, I'm all right, really. in the garden. Oh, I don't like it like this. are not blown over. Oh, that great tree. Just lying there. Uncle Alan? Yes, Tom? Was there a big storm last night? Uh, no, there wasn't. Uh, why do you ask? I, I thought I heard something. Oh, the barometer has been steady for some days. There is no likelihood of stormy weather. <laughs> but I saw a... Saw what, Tom? No, nothing. Anyway, the other trees will still be there. Peter, the fir tree is back. I don't understand. I saw the lightning strike it. I saw it fall. <laughs> there are other people in the garden. Boys... I've never seen them before. And Pat is tagging us again. I'm here too. Hello, I'm here. Patty always tags us. Ignore her. What's the news on the rat shoot, Hubert? 
The miller says it's to be tonight. Young Barty's coming over and we'll all go along together. I'd like to come to the rat shoot. Oh, Hubert, will it be after dark? Definitely. You can bring the hurricane lamp, James. I'll take the air gun. Edgar, you're too young. You'd better stay behind. Hattie's too young. I'm not. Uh, can you see me, James? Oh, go on, Hubert. Let Edgar come. No, all right. We'll all three go. No, you can't see me. Oh, it's not much fun being invisible. <laughs> Let's all run from Hattie. <laughs> you always run away from me. Oh. Hattie? Oh, you silly juggins, you. Now, come on, get up. Why don't you look where you're going? Oh, I've got green stains all over my pinafore. What will Aunt say? I expect they'll brush off. Oh, no, James, you're making them worse. Well, I can't help you. I'm off with the others. They're making for the house. I'm going after them. Is that a letter or a drawing, Tom? It's a drawing for Peter. Uncle Alan? Yes, Tom? Can a tree be lying fallen at one time and then be standing up again as it was before it fell? Hmm. Tell us where and when this extraordinary incident happened. Where and when, Tom? It was a fairy tree. Goblin woodcutters laid it low, didn't they, Tom? It fell in a storm. Lightning struck it. Well, I'd still like to know... And now Tom mustn't speak until he's finished his letter. The apples look good. Shame we're not allowed to have any. We were only told not to pick them. Come on, James. Edgar. Shake the tree and make them fall. <laughs> This one's mine. It's Hattie, spying as usual. Give me an apple, please, Edgar. Or you'll tell, I suppose. Spy and tell tale. Here you are, Hattie. Catch. Thank you, James. And you don't leave the core on the lawn as you did last time. Or you'll get yourself into trouble. And us too, perhaps. I won't. What is it, Pincher? It's all right, Pincher. There's nothing there. Hattie, what did you stick your tongue out for? My tongue was hot in my mouth. I wanted some fresh air. Don't give pert lying answers. Let it be, Edgar. May as well get back inside. Come on, Doc. Calm down. Where's Hattie? Hiding among the trees somewhere. Hattie, where are you? Cooey! Hattie, you are hiding from me. You can see me, can't you? I knew you could when you put your tongue out at me. I followed you and watched you and hidden from you often and often and often. Of course I can see you. In episode one of Tom's Midnight Garden by Philippa Pierce, the cast was Tom, Peter England, Aunt Gwen, Una Stubbs, Uncle Alan, Crawford Logan, Abel, Callum McPherson, Older Hattie, Deborah Berlin, Young Hattie, Sarah Morton, Mrs. Long, Judy Parkin, The Man with the Car, David Holt, James, Tim Godwin, Peter, George Miller, Edgar, Robert Thomas, and Hubert, Oliver Grigg. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Tom's Midnight Garden was dramatised by Judy Allen, with music by Elizabeth Parker, and directed by John Taylor. When Tom Long is sent away to stay at his aunt and uncle's flat in a large old house, he discovers a mysterious garden which only appears at night. Although Tom can see the children who play in the garden, they are quite unable to see or hear him. But it seems to Tom that the girl, Hattie, is different. Tom's Midnight Garden by Philippa Pierce Dramatised for radio by Judy Allen Episode 2 You don't hide badly for a girl I saw you climbing the trees. 
I saw when you went right through the orchard door. I saw you often and often. Sometimes I sort of knew I was being watched. And I saw your footprints once. I'm Tom Long. I know you're called Hattie. A princess Hattie, if you please. I am a princess. If you're a princess, your father and mother must be a king and queen. And where's their kingdom? I'm not allowed to say. Why not? I'm a prisoner here. There's someone who calls herself my aunt, but she isn't. She's wicked and cruel to me. I think I've seen her. Is she a tall lady in purple? Yes, and those boys aren't really my cousins either. Now you know my secret. I will allow myself to play with you. I'm not used to playing silly girls' games. I'll show you where I hide. Do they let you play in the rain? I'm not supposed to play here at all. Look, this bush is hollow. <laughs> well, I didn't spot this. And here, behind these ferns, here's another hiding place. But wait for me! Oh, now where... Uh... Oh, Hattie, you're not behind the ferns. Hattie! Ha! Oh, you made <laughs> me jump! I love this fir tree. I stand behind it. Then when people come to look for me, I move around the trunk really quietly. <laughs> so it's always between me and them. And over here is the vegetable garden. I've been here before. Did you look under these sacks? It's rhubarb. Did you once leave a note here? And did you once find one? Yes, a list of fairies. Fairies? Whoever could have put that there? To fairies. Fancy. Come on, Tom, I'll show you more. Oh, this is the door I pushed through. Yes, I know, I saw you. <laughs> This is the heating house. It's drier here. Well, I don't get wet anyway. Oh, and here's the bag where Abel collects the hen and goose feathers. <laughs> <laughs> They'll go everywhere! Stop it! What's that thing? That's the stove, to make the greenhouse warm. And up there... No, I can't reach. Well, those are Abel's books. I can see the one on the top. The Bible. That's right. Abel says the Bible must be above all the other books. Like... Like the Queen rolling over all England. Oof, it's stifling in here. It has to be warm. These are tropical plants. Ow, that's sharp. Be careful. It's a spiny cactus. And this is a castor oil plant. Oh. Come over here. Watch me touch the sensitive plant. Watch. See how the leaves droop and fold up. I've never seen one before. Look. It does it for you too. And that leaf. And that one! Oh, thing. I've drooped the whole plant. Come and look through the coloured glass in the door. The purple glass makes it seem as though a thunderstorm's coming. <laughs> this one makes everything yellow, like lemonade. Try the red one. The garden's on fire. <laughs> what about this one? Green flowers and a green sky. And if you look through here... It's just plain glass. No, it has a star engraved on it. Oh, I can't see anything through the star. Sometimes I like that best of all. You look and see nothing. I think there is no garden at all. But all the time there is, waiting for you. It isn't always there for me. What do you mean? Nothing. Never mind. Let's look through the lemonade one again. <laughs> Mum, can I read my comic now? No, Peter. I let you read Tom's letter and that's enough. People with measles mustn't strain their eyes. I expect Tom will forget about me. Oh, nonsense. I'm sure he's missing you just as much as you're missing him. He'll have found someone else to play with. Oh, I hardly think so. He's still in quarantine. I suppose so. Peter, what does Tom write about in those letters? Oh, nothing. Just food. <laughs> Poor Tom. I expect that's all he has to think about. Well, there can't be much for him to do indoors all day. Come on, Tom. Where are we going? To the vegetable garden. Why? What for? You'll see. Oh, wait. Stop. What's the matter? Someone's following us. Listen. I can't hear anything. We must wait till he's gone. Come on, Tom. I have something to show you. Oh, can't we? This is called the burning bush. Here, Tom. Some other leaves. Are they meant to smell of scorching? James says the smell is lemon verbena. Why is it called the burning bush, then? They say that if you come out at midnight on Midsummer's Eve and set light to a single leaf, the whole plant will blaze up. <laughs> Have you tried? Of course not. There's only one plant, and we don't want it to burn to ashes. Shall I tell you a secret? If you like. 
This is grown from a slip of the real burning bush, the one that burnt when Moses was there. But that was long ago, in the Bible. Well, I shan't tell you secrets ever again. Who's that? Oh. What are you up to, Cousin Hattie? Oh, it's you, Cousin Edgar. I'm not up to anything. For the last five minutes, you've been talking and nodding and smiling, all by yourself. I'm not by myself. I'm talking to a friend. And where is your friend? Standing beside me, of course. <laughs> really, Cousin Hattie, people will think you're queer in the head. Once it was fairies, and now it's someone who isn't even there. Oh. <laughs> James! Hubert! Well, now he'll go and tell the others, and they'll jeer at me. And Aunt Grace will say it shows I'm not fit to play with the children in the village. Well, why did you tell him about me? Well, one must tell the truth, mustn't one? Come on, now we can go and look at the trap. Over here! See? Oh, poor thing! It's Abel's sparrow trap. I really think he'd rather the birds died of hunger than ate his seeds. There. Does he know you let the birds out? Of course not. That's why we had to come here secretly. Oh, Hattie, look, a frog! Oh, we must catch it! Abel says they eat the strawberries. <laughs> I'll chase it towards you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll set it free by the pond. Hey, mother, doesn't mind me. Mind you don't touch them too. Oh, Tom. It's so sad about Abel. Sad? He had just one brother, and his brother was very jealous of him. And one day, in the fields, his brother attacked Abel with a weapon, murderously. Go on. He killed Abel. I, I mean, he nearly killed him. There was a great deal of blood. <clears throat> it lay smoking on the ground in the field. Oh, was Abel's brother called Cain? The story of Cain and Abel is in the Bible, and Cain really did kill Abel. I think this Abel is just called after him, that's all. Suppose I said Susan told me that story, and Susan is Abel's sweetheart. I'm not sure you don't tell... fibs. I shan't ever tell you any more secrets, ever. The first yew tree you climbed is called the Matterhorn. Is it? Yes, and the one next to it is the steps of St Paul's. Because you can almost walk up the branches. And the one right down there is Trixie. Why Trixie? It's difficult to climb. There are no branches low down. You have to swarm up the trunk. Hubert and James and Edgar have all climbed it. Have you? No. Princesses don't swarm. Dear Peter, there are so many things to do out in the garden. Hattie's only a girl, but it's all right. She's better at hiding than I am, but I'm better at climbing. She has names for everything, but I know how to make things. I always mean to ask Hattie questions about the garden, but when I'm out there I seem to forget. I don't know why. Now, you have to cut a notch at each end for the bowstring. Uh, uh, make one there. Hubert and James and Edgar used to make bows and arrows and play at Forest Outlaws. Uh, cut away from you or you hurt yourself. They said I was too young. And when I was old enough, they said they were too old. Now, cut a notch at the other end. Arrows are easy, but I couldn't have made a bow by myself. Have you got the string? Here. Right, tie the string round one of the notches. And now you have to bend the bow and tie the string to the other end. It has to bend more than that. I can't. Well, I can't help you. I haven't any strength while I'm out here. There's Abel. Abel! Come in, Miss Hattie. Can you help me with this, please? Hi. I can string it for you. This is your knife work, Miss Hattie? Yes, indeed it is. And who taught you to do it? Someone. Well, whoever it was taught you, take care he don't teach you trouble with it. Trouble? Trouble for yourself, Miss Hattie. It's a good bow. I wish I could use it. <sighs> oh, 
It's stuck in Trixie. <laughs> Why don't you shoot a bird? Tom, no. There isn't the slightest danger you'd ever hit one. I like to shoot into the air. Oh, no! Oh, we shouldn't get further away from the greenhouse. Oh, did anyone hear? I don't think so. Are you sure? Is anyone looking out of any of the windows? Yes. Well, I can't see anyone, can you? I don't think so. No. Oh, Tom. I will be so very angry. There's someone in the greenhouse. It's Abel. Oh, Abel, it was an accident. I right, maybe. <laughs> there now, Miss Hattie. I have a spare pane of glass. Can you repair it? I can. Thank you. Aunt won't ever know. Will she? No, she won't. But do you remember what I told you of? You mean about being taught trouble? Aye. I do that. You didn't tell me there were sheep here. Or geese. The goslings are nearly as big as the geese. Ah, here's the arrow, Hattie. You'll have to pick it up. I can't. Let's sit in the bank and watch the river. Sometimes there are floods and the water overflows into this very meadow. It isn't a very big river. It gets bigger downstream. It flows to Castleford and then to Ely and then down and down to the sea. So they say. But all rivers flow to the sea. Do you paddle here sometimes? I'm not allowed in this meadow at all because of the river. We must get back. Oh, all right then. Come on, quickly. Aunt says I might get my clothes muddy. Or if I might get drowned, and that would be very troublesome for everybody. <laughs> the geese are watching to make sure we go back through the hedge. Perhaps they thought we should have been in their meadow. <laughs> Aunt Gwen, is there a river near here? What did you say, Tom? Is there a river nearby? I think so. Yes, I'm sure there is. It's somewhere behind the houses over at the back. And are there geese? Oh, I don't know about geese. Perhaps when your quarantine is over, we could go and look. Yes, I'd like to. I hope you won't be disappointed. It isn't a very big river. It's nothing special. I never get dressed to go down to the garden. I go in my pyjamas and just one slipper because I use the other to wedge open the door of the flat. But I never feel cold, even when it's early morning out there and the grass is wet with dew. through the hedge. Oh, goose nests is everywhere. Oh, Abel. Abel? What are the geese doing on the door? What's the point? I'll get them away, Mum, just as soon as I can. Come on, move now. Come on, move gently. Pinch her. I nearly fell over you. I can hide in Hattie's hollow bush. Well, I know they can't see me. Don't fight, Mum. Spread out, lads. I'll get this side. Don't hurry up. We'll drive them out into the orchard, then I'll get them round to that old meadow again. Hattie, run and open the orchard door. Get the dog away. They're all over the flower beds. Oh, there were ten of them. You just had a hundred. Pincher! Indoors with you. Let them settle. They're making the orchard door anyway. We just walk behind them. Just gently, gently. Edgar, can you ready to shut the door when we're through? <laughs> The lettuces are gone, and the seedlings all trampled. I've never seen such a mess. I am still waiting for someone to tell me how the geese got into the garden. There'd be a gap and tunnel in the hedge at the end, Mum. How they made it is more than I know, unless the devil himself told them. The geese didn't make it. Hattie did. Harriet? Yes, Aunt? So, you are to blame. I'm sorry, I didn't know the, the geese... The rest would... of you may go. Yes, you are to blame for all this, Harriet. You charity child, you thankless pauper. I received you into my home as a duty to my late husband, your uncle. I expected you to be grateful and obedient, but you are not. You are an expense and a shame to me, and to your cousins. You are to go straight to your room. Oh, Hattie, will she beat you? No, it's all right. Who are you talking to? Come along, girl! Quickly, inside! That was horrible. She's horrible. 
Who's that? Oh, where did you come from? Don't cry. What's the matter? Are you lost? No. Well, what are you crying for? For my home. Where is your home? I want my mother. I want my father. <laughs> Hattie's aunt was so horrible to her, you can't imagine. And then I found this little girl in the garden, all dressed in black. She was crying and crying, and then I suddenly understood. Peter, I don't know how it's possible, but it was Hattie, a much younger Hattie. She had just lost her parents and come to this house. She was so unhappy. I will go back to the garden tomorrow night. But I'm afraid it may not be the same. Hattie, 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 where are you? I've looked in all your hiding places. Have you gone forever? The orchard door is the last place. Oh, do I have to push through it again? Oh. oh, Hattie, there you are. Why didn't you answer? I called and called. I was helping Abel with his bonfire. You could have opened the orchard door for me. I like bonfires too. You wouldn't have liked what we were burning on this one. What were you burning? The bows and arrows. Oh, Tom, it was Abel who wanted them burnt. Why? He says they're dangerous, and he knew I borrowed a kitchen knife to make them. He said if I promised never to use a kitchen knife again, he'd give me a little knife of my own. What kind of knife? He bought it for Susan, but she said it's unlucky to have a knife from your sweetheart. It's a dear little knife. It has just one blade. See? You could just about cut butter with that. I've cut more than butter with this already. Come on, I'll show you. <sighs> there, on the trunk. H M. That means Hattie Melbourne has climbed this tree. I've carved my initials on all the yew trees, except Trixie, of course. It's very wrong to carve things on trees. It's like leaving litter about. I don't see how it can be. You'll get into trouble because people know they're your initials. If I wanted to carve on a tree, or which I wouldn't ever, I'd draw my secret mark. What is it? A long cat. Well, it's supposed to be a tom cat. For Tom Long. Uh, you could draw a hat for Hattie. Only, of course, you mustn't. Come on, I'll teach you to climb Trixie. Well, I have to swarm. It's easy. I'll show you. I mustn't get my pockets dirty. I'll be very quiet. Carrot, Tom. Oh, thank you. Do you know, Tom, I think you've grown since you've been here. Oh, boy. I suppose it's only to be expected. You are a few weeks older than when you arrived. <laughs> well, people always get older, don't they? Yes, dear. I mean, they never get younger. Well, not usually. What a funny thing to say. <sighs> only two days now, Tom. What is? Until you go home. I know you must be looking forward to it, but we shall miss you. Time's gone very fast. Yes, time keeps marching on. That's the sundial, high up on the wall there. I saw it before. I can't work out how it tells the time. A run! It's gone behind the stone sunbeam. Do you think it has a nest there? Well, I can't see it from here. James once walked along the top of that wall. He climbed up by the pear tree. Well, I'm not going to. It's far too high. I didn't mean you should. James did it because Cousin Edgar dared him. He walked the whole length. Then he climbed down. Then he fought Cousin Edgar. And then he was sick. Cousin Hubert was very angry. He said James might have fallen and broken his neck. I might fall, but I wouldn't bruise or break. I haven't got much weight in this garden. I I'm going to do it. I'm going to walk along that wall and look for a nest behind the sundial. Oh, Tom! Don't worry. It's all right for me. Oh, it is high. Please be careful. There is a wren's nest, but I won't touch it or I'll frighten her. Come on down now, Tom. What a view. If only you could be up in the shelf. What can you see? Can Susan at one of the windows of the house. Oh, and Abel running. And in the courtyard at the side, everything's giving Pinch a bath. <laughs> Pinch has bolted. <laughs> Just chasing him. What do you see beyond the garden? I can see the river. And if you look along the river... Yes? Miss Hattie. Oh! What is it? 
Miss Miss Hattie, you must never climb that high wall. It'd be dangerous. I wasn't going to. You must swear that you never will. Here, on the Holy Bible. I swear a table. I never will. Hattie? Do you remember that, Miss Hattie? Hattie, what on earth was the matter? Abel thought I was going to walk along the top of the wall. He wanted to stop me because of the danger. It looked as though he pushed you over. He made me kneel on the path and swear on his Bible that I never would. Was he very angry? No. I think, somehow, he was frightened. You mean you were frightened he was angry? No, I was a little frightened because he was so quick. But he was more frightened. When he made me take his Bible, his hand shook. Why did he suddenly think he might try to climb up? I suppose he saw the way I was looking at the wall. No, he was running with his Bible in his hand before he could possibly have seen you. Perhaps he heard me talking to you up there. You were only speaking quietly. And you were talking very loudly. But, but you're the only one who can hear me. Or see me. I don't understand. I, uh, I wish I didn't have to go home tomorrow. What? Oh, Tom, would you like to stay? Yes. Well, send a telegram at once. Why? What is there to interest a boy here? Oh, I like it. We'll do so much now you're out of quarantine. I'll take you to the museum in Castleford. It's only a bus ride away. And we can go shopping together. I'm not sure that boys like shopping. Well, we go to the pictures then. There's a nice cinema in Castleford. You'll like that, won't you, Tom? It's so strange the way the garden is only there at night. I've been trying to work it out. I think the garden and Hattie must somehow be ghosts. The garden comes and goes, but Mrs Bartholomew's clock is always here. I keep looking at the picture on its face, the angel reading the book. If only I could see what's in that book. Mrs Bartholomew! Once there must have been a Mr Bartholomew. Probably his family owned this house for generations. He'd have known all its stories, and he'd have told Mrs. Bartholomew, and she'd still remember. People seem to be a bit afraid of her, but I have to talk to her. More potatoes, Tom, dear? Uh, no, thank you. When Mr. Bartholomew lived here... Ah, uh, Mr. Bartholomew, whoever he was... Uh, never lived in this house. Mrs. Bartholomew was a widow when she came here, and that was only a few years ago. But what about the grandfather clock in the hall? You said it belonged to her, but it's always been here, ever since the house had a garden. And what reason have you for supposing that, Tom? Oh, um... You know, Alan, the clock certainly must have been here a long time, because the screws at the back have all rusted into the wall. Hmm. Well, now, that might explain things, if the clock couldn't be moved without danger of damaging it, old Mrs. Bartholomew would have had to buy it with the house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You see, Tom? All quite straightforward if you reason it out. No point talking to Mrs. Bartholomew, then. Uh, what did you say? Uh, nothing. I get the pudding. I don't know why your cousins never thought of building a tree house up here. Well, they didn't. I found a good floor, didn't I? But no, you just have to finish the walls. But you need to wedge that plank just there. But what's it like to be dead and a ghost? Oh, do tell me, Tom. I'm not a ghost. Don't be silly. I saw you go through the orchard door when it was shut. I'm not a ghost. The orchard door is. And the garden is, and so are you. Indeed I'm not. Why do you think you wear those clothes? They don't belong to nowadays, I know. But they're my pyjamas. You wear strange clothes that no one wears nowadays because you're a ghost. Why, I'm the only person in the garden who sees you. I can see a ghost. I, I could put my hand right through you. Uh, there. <laughs> I've proved it. You're dead and gone and a ghost. Oh, I'm not dead. Oh, please, Tom, I'm... I'm not dead. Oh, all right, Hattie. You're not dead. I, I take it all back. You're not a ghost. Oh, um, don't cry. All right. Uh, go on building the treehouse. I'll go on telling you how. Mind you, I'm not a ghost either. Dear Peter, 
I'm glad your measles are better. I've tried to find out when Hattie lived. I looked up costume in Uncle Alan's encyclopedia. Her cousins wear trousers, and trousers weren't invented until the early Victorian period. Hattie's aunt and Susan the maid wear long skirts. Aunt Gwen says women wore long skirts all through Queen Victoria's reign. Hattie must be an early Victorian, an early Victorian ghost. Burn after reading. <laughs> What are you burning, Peter? Just rubbish. You know, I still don't understand why Tom wants to stay on with Gwen and Alan. They're very kind, but it must be so dull for him. There must be something he enjoys. He's put off coming home twice now. Does he tell you any more, Peter? In his letters? I think he just likes being there. I suppose he'll have to come home for the autumn term. Well, we must have him home before that. I suppose I could go too and stay with him. You can't want to go and stay in a flat. I do. Then I lie awake at night and wish I were there, and then I fall asleep and dream that I'm there. But why? He's missing his brother. That's all. Don't worry, Peter. Tom will be home very soon. Then you can show him your new treehouse. Our treehouse is here. Has Abel seen it? No, I've been careful to keep out of his sight. I haven't bothered about that. <laughs> but of course he's never seen me anyway. Of course not. Is this to be like a real house? It should have proper windows, not just accidental gaps. You're expecting too much. It doesn't have to be a house at all. It could be the captain's cabin on a ship at sea. And I could do it better from outside. Mm -hmm. Tom, this is quite bad this side. Uh, oh, yes, I've been out on that one. Uh, only I guess I am different. I, I wouldn't advise you to... Hattie! In episode two of Tom's Midnight Garden by Philippa Pierce, the cast was Tom, Peter England, Aunt Gwen, Una Stubbs, Uncle Alan, Crawford Logan, Abel, Callum McPherson, Young Hattie, Sarah Morton, Mrs. Long, Judy Parkin, Mr. Long, David Holt, James, Tim Godwin, Peter, George Miller, Edgar, Robert Thomas, Hubert, Oliver Grigg, and Baby Hattie, Ruby Isla Seremal. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Tom's Midnight Garden was dramatised by Judy Allen with music by Elizabeth Parker and directed by John Taylor. Tom Long, staying with his aunt and uncle, discovers a mysterious garden which only appears at night. He befriends Hattie, who seems, like the garden, to come from another time, and is the only one able to see him. But the friendship with Hattie brings trouble to them both. Tom's Midnight Garden by Philippa Pierce Dramatised for radio by Judy Allen Episode 3 Hattie! Hattie, wake up! You fell from the tree house! There's blood on your head! Abel's coming, he'll help! Miss Hattie! Come on! Up you come! Hattie, you alright? Are you alright? Get you gone! What? Get you back to hell where you come from! I've seen you always, and thought best not to see you, and heard you, and thought best to see death, but I know you for what you are. Oh, he was Hattie alive, or was she dead? Ah, <laughs> oh, you tried to kill her off in the nest. Her that had neither mother, nor father, nor home here. 
Nothing but her innocence against your devilry with your bulls and arrows and knives and high places. Now get you gone! May the Lord keep me from all the works of the devil that he hurt me not. Susan! It's Miss Hattie. She'd be hurt bad. Oh, let me in, Abel! Open the door, it's my only way home! Abel! Hattie! Abel! Please, let me in! Oh, I'm too tired, I can't push through. Oh, please! Master James is fetching the doctor. You best go now, Abel, or the mistress stays indoors in the booth. Take care of her, Susan. Wait! Abel, please, how is Hattie? Wait! Abel, please, Abel, she's not dead, is she? She's not dead! No, she's alive. Oh, Hattie's alive. And Abel hasn't quite shut the door. But, oh, Peter, the hall has all its old furniture again. The old stuff isn't fading away like it did before. It's staying. I'm in Hattie's house, but I don't know where Hattie is. I keep thinking she must be a ghost. I can't see any other explanation. And people have to die. They have to die before they become ghosts. Is this how Hattie died? Falling from our treehouse? If I go upstairs, perhaps I'll find her. Perhaps she's all right after all. Hattie! Hattie! Hattie, is that you? Now there's someone coming. What if he can see me too? No, he can't. Mother? Who is that? It's James. James? But he's a grown-up. You can come in. I'm only brushing my hair. Uh, how's Hattie? Hattie will do well enough. Is that what the doctor said? Yes. We must be thankful then. Thankful? But what was she doing to have that accident? Climbing trees, if you please. Has she no sense of what is fitting to her sex? And to her age now? She's old enough to know better. But he is young for her age. Perhaps it comes from her being by herself so much, playing alone in the garden. Oh, you were always kind to her. And so is Hattie never to grow up? Is that it? Pass me my hairpins. Of course Hattie will grow up. Good for you, James. But I think we should begin to consider what is to become of her then. She is not to expect anything more from me, surely. I've given her charity enough. In that case, Mother, she will have to earn her own living. Although how she is to do that, I don't know. Or perhaps she will marry. Although, again, I don't know how. She knows no one and meets no one outside this house and garden. I will not have her ruling here when I'm gone. What do you mean, Mother? If you or Hubert or Edgar should ever think of marrying Harriet, do not expect to have a penny from me. Well, Hubert has never cared for the girl, and I believe Edgar dislikes her. But you have pitied her. Go on, James. Say you'll marry Hattie. Mother, I have no intention of marrying Hattie. But I do believe she is to be pitied. She is pitiable, certainly. Well, surely now she is growing up, she should meet more people. Oh, you know perfectly well she loves only to be alone in the garden. We must make her want more. She must not be allowed any longer to hide away from our friends when they call. When we make up parties, we must encourage her to join in. Boating, picnics, whist drives, skating in winter. Huh. I'll go to her now and tell her that when she is well again, we all want her to go out more and make friends. We all? Well, may I say that you wish it, Mother? Oh, you may say what you like to her. You may do what you like with her, and the less I see of her, the better. Thank you, Mother. Tom! Oh, it's so nice that you're here. I've never seen you outside the garden before. I wanted to know you're all right, but I thought I ought to wait on the landing until James had finished talking to you. You could have come in. He would never have known. James has grown up. You're older too. I didn't notice it happening. What? Uh, nothing. How are you? Very well. I just have to keep this bandage on for a few days, but the doctor says the scar on my forehead won't show. And Cousin James says I must do other things besides falling out of trees in the future. Things without me? Oh, no, Tom. 
Whenever you want to come, so you shall. Come on, sit on the bed and talk to me. This is a big room, isn't it? But you've got bars across the bottom of your windows, as if it were a nursery. They look familiar. This was my cousin's nursery when they were little, and after that, my nursery. And then, because I was the last child, it stayed my bedroom. You have two windows. Where is the bathroom in this house? Bathroom? Well, where do you have your bath? In here, of course. Just as the boys do in their bedroom. Here? How? The tin bath is brought in, and Susan carries cans of hot water up from the kitchen. In winter, my fire is lit, and I have my bath beside it. You could make a proper bathroom here. You could run a partition somewhere down the middle of this room, here, so there'd be a window on either side. Then this part could still be my a bedroom, and the room on the other side could be a bathroom. Well, that's a stupid idea. This would only be a slice of a room then. Yes, and the partition will be, would be thin, and you'd be able to hear if anyone had a bath next door. Oh, I'd never want to hear that. I don't suppose you ever will. Other people may. I like your room better, and I like your view better. Better than what? Better, better than if there were nothing but houses opposite. <laughs> don't be silly, Tom. Why would there be houses out there? I wish there was still this room. And this view, I don't understand you. Oh, Tom, don't sound so sad. Hattie, what does the picture on the grandfather clock mean? The angel reading the book. Um, something from the Bible. It's difficult to understand, so I can't remember it exactly. I'll find out if you want to know. Oh yes, please. Who will you ask? I shall ask the clock. It's written there. I've never seen it. No, you can't. It's written so low down on the clock face that it's hidden by the edge of the dial door. First, you have to unlock the pendulum case. Inside, there is a catch. You release that, and the door that covers the clock face opens. Then you can see the words. Who keeps the key to the pendulum case? The grandfather clock keeps it. The key is always in the keyhole. But anyone might unlock it. Only Aunt needs to to wind it. She's forbidden anyone else to touch it. The key isn't there now. I mean, I can't unlock it. Next time I'm downstairs, if there's nobody about, I'll open the dial door, and then you can read the secret for yourself. Thank you. I'll show you a secret now. Come here now. Look up there, between the window and the shutter. Do you see? It looks like bits of black cloth. What is it? Bats. They sleep there in the daytime and fly out into the garden at night. Once. One flew into my room by mistake. What did you do? I screamed and screamed. Susan had told me bats get caught in your hair, and then all your hair has to be cut off to get rid of them. I don't think that's true. No, but I believed it then. Susan had to come in and chase it out for me. Mice come in too, especially in the autumn after the harvest. I can hear them running races behind the skirting boards. And I'll show you something else. In here, your clothes. No, my special place under this floorboard. It's never been nailed down, so it's really easy to lift up. It's been my secret hiding place since I was a child. Uh, I remember your little penknife, the one Abel gave me. And here's my paint box, and this is where I keep the picture. Who are those people? They were my mother and father long ago. You remember, Tom? I once used to pretend they were a king and queen. <gasps> That'll be Susan. I'd better get back into bed. Now, Miss Hattie, it's time for you to sleep. I've come to take your lamp. Thank you, Susan. Will you leave the door a little open? I'd like to see the light from the hall. Yes, I will. Good night, Miss Hattie. I'd better go too. Very well. I'll see you tomorrow. You always say that, and then you don't come again for ages. I come every night. You don't. There are often months and months between your visits. Never mind. Good night, Tom. Good night, Hattie. I will come tomorrow. Peter.
Peter. Oh, I wish you were here. I can't get back. I keep going out in the garden and then coming in again. But the old furniture won't fade away. It's quite solid. The house is still Hattie's house. I can't get back into Aunt Gwen and Uncle Alan's flat. What will I do? I'll go back to Hattie's room. But my room. Hattie. I don't want to give you a fright. I'll just sit here by the bed. And as soon as you wake up, I'll ask if you know what to do. sleep in Hattie's room, but I've woken up in mine. How does it work? Oh, I was right about the room. The window's the same. The door's the same. This was Hattie's room. Well, half of Hattie's room. The other half is the bathroom. My slipper! What if they find the flat door wedged with my slipper? Do. Nothing, Aunt Gwen. I was, um, just, uh... You want the bathroom, don't you? Yes, yes. Uncle Alan won't be long. He's always ready for breakfast by half past seven. Can you wait? Shall I get him to hug? Uh, no, no, I'm all right. Thank you. Not much post this morning. Just one letter for you and one for Tom. Oh, that's nice. Look. Tom, mine is from your mother, and yours is from Peter. Thank you. Dear Tom, beware. Mother is writing to Aunt Gwen to say you can come home at the end of the week. And this time, you really are to. I think Mother will say you must come, because I miss you. But I don't want you to come away. I like all you write in your letters. Tell me some more. I wish I was there, but Mother and Father say no. I wish we had more trees in a river near. I wish I was there. Yours, Pete. <sighs> well, Tom, so we must really say goodbye to you soon. When? There's a cheap train on Saturday morning. Your mother says you can go by train now you're out of quarantine. Next Saturday? That's only four days away. <clears throat> I wish I'll miss you, Tom. Your father and mother send their special love, Tom, and they look forward to seeing you again soon. Your mother says Peter's been missing you very much. <laughs> we could hardly expect to keep you longer unless we adopted you. <laughs> I do want to see them all again. But if you did adopt me... I was only joking, Tom. Perhaps next year you'll come again and spend part of your summer holiday with us. That's a long time away. Every one of your ticks brings Saturday nearer. How am I going to have time to do everything I want to do in the garden in just four nights? You're the link. You know the secret of time and the garden. And tonight, after you strike 13, Hattie will open your door for me and I'll know the secret too. <laughs> what are you doing down there, Tom? You know you mustn't touch Mrs. Bartholomew's clock. I, I was just a bit bored. Can we go and see the river? Oh, yes. Now that you're out of quarantine, we can. It's very built up along there, but if we go to the bridge, we can see it. I'm sure I can find the way. Here's your river, Tom. It doesn't run through fields then. Not this stretch, I'm afraid, no. What's that notice? These waters have been certified as unsuitable for fishing 
and bathing owing to pollution. Dreadful stuff gets into rivers these days, I believe. No geese, you know. And can't you bathe or paddle anywhere? There's bathing at Castleford. This river flows down to Castleford, you know. To Castleford, Ely, Kings live in the sea. Yes. Tom, how did you know that bit of geography? Uh, someone told me. Uh, what is the time, please? Four o'clock. Is that all? Oh, dear Peter, today is going so slowly. I want it to be tonight. Tonight, Hattie is going to show me the secret of the clock. Snow! Footprints. I think they're going to the pond. Skating is so wonderful, though I do not dare let go of the chair yet. Hattie, you remember you but said... you're thinner. No, I'm fatter, Aunt Gwen Wade. Me. No, I didn't mean that. I meant thinner through. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what I meant. It doesn't matter. Hattie, you promised to find out for me about the writing on the grandfather clock. Did I? When you fell from our treehouse. You promised? <laughs> Why, that was long ago. You waited until now, Tom. Couldn't you wait a little longer? You can watch me skate. Uh, Hattie, you must keep your promise. Oh, very well. But it means I must take off my skating boots and put on my shoes. Oh, my skating is improving so much. As soon as I can skate without holding on to the chair, I'll be able to skate on the river ice with the others. Hubert and James and Edgar and the Chapman girls and young Barty. Have you never learned to skate, Tom? Y yes, I can skate. L are you ready? Oh, come along, then. <sighs> I'll show you the clock. Oh. Aunt will be upstairs. If I'm quick, she'll never know. On the pendulum, it says time no longer. Yes, that's it. Ah, here's the catch. Yes, but no longer than what? You don't understand. Wait. There. Now you can see. Under the feet of the angel with his book. I thought it was the book of Revelation, but I couldn't remember the chapter. Or verse. Rev 10, 1 to 6. Shh. Wasn't that a movement upstairs? Come on. Let's go outside again. Uh, Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 to 6. I ought to get my Bible and look it up for you, but it's upstairs. Well, what about Abel's Bible? In the heating house. Oh, yes. Come along. Leave the door open, Tom, to let in the light. There's the Bible. <laughs> Evil still keeps us on top of the other books. <coughs> oh, Hattie, you're taller. You couldn't reach it before. Let's see. Epistle to James. First of Peter. Second of Peter. First of John. Second of John. Jude. Revelation! Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Miss Hattie? Abel! Oh, Abel, do you mind? We, I mean, of course, I wanted to look something up in your Bible. I'm very sorry if you object. I'll put the book back, of course. No. No. For there's truth in that book and salvation. Them that reads in that book, they cannot be altogether damned. Abel, I hope you don't think I'm damned. I wasn't speaking to you, Miss Hattie. I'll leave you to it. He can be a bit strange sometimes. Still, he doesn't seem to mind. Good. Here it is. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open. That's the angel on the clock. Yes. Listen. And he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, 
and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So he sealed up the secret. Be patient, Tom. It goes on. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven, that there should be time no longer. I don't understand. Mm, it's difficult. The book of Revelation is full of angels and beasts and strange sayings. I don't think anyone knows for certain what it all means. But the last bit. Time no longer. What does that mean? I'm not really sure. I must know. It's important. It's on the pendulum of the clock. And the angel swore it. He swore there should be time no longer. What did he mean? Perhaps when the last trump sounds. Oh, let's go to the pond. I can see Abel sweeping the ice for me. Come and watch me skate. I almost understand. And then it slips away. I need to think. I have to work it out. Dear Peter, I've been thinking about time. The angel on the grandfather clock says, time no longer. But if time is ever to end, that means that here and now, time is only a temporary thing. That's why it can change in the garden, always being the past, but not always the same bit of the past. So I thought, perhaps I might be able to dodge behind time's back and have the past, which is at his present, all the time, as well as having my here and now. But to do that, I have to understand how time works. Tom! Breakfast is ready. Aunt Gwen, what is time? Half past seven, Tom. There are your eggs, Alan. Uh, and yours, Tom, dear? No, I mean, what is time? How does time work? Ah, no. Time. <clears throat> There is no one answer to that question, although there are, of course, many theories which I could explain to you. I've heard a theory. <clears throat> what? Yeah, what theory? That in the end, there will be time no longer. I don't believe I know that one. An angel said it. An angel? What on earth have angels to do with scientific theories? Well, um... Hello. Can't have conversations like this at breakfast time. <clears throat> I wish you wouldn't. I didn't know he felt like that about angels. Your uncle is as reverent as anyone about angels in their proper place, but his nerves are always a little edgy early in the morning. Mm. It's so easy to make him lose his temper. Then he leaves his breakfast. It all leads to indigestion. I'm sorry. Alan, please don't be angry. That boy deliberately provokes me. He doesn't mean to. Do come back and reassure him. <sighs> Very well. Tom, I apologise. Come and finish your breakfast, Alan. No, I should like to explain to Tom. Now, Tom, <clears throat> you see, it was once thought that time flowed on as a never-ending stream without relation to anything else, hmm? But if you will look at this diagram, Tom, you will see that modern theories of time are more complex than that. I don't understand. I don't understand. You see the position in time of point A. Hmm? Or, for instance, think of Rip Van Winkle. Rip Van Winkle fell asleep in an enchanted place on a mountainside. He thought he'd slept for one night, but when he returned to his family, he found that 20 years had gone by. Yes, yes, Rip Van Winkle isn't very illuminating. <clears throat> Let's think of Einstein's theory of relativity. I like Rip Van Winkle in reverse. Instead of going forward, I go back to Hattie's time. 
but not always to the same time, nor in the proper order. The fir tree was standing, fallen, then standing again. Had he been my age and younger and older? My visits have covered about ten years, but only a few weeks of my own time have passed. How fast and in what direction? Is it that different people have different times, though they're really all bits of the same big time? Well, one could say more accurately that I might be able to step back into someone else's time in the past, or she might be able to step forward into my time, which would seem like the future to her, though to me it's the present. No, it would be clearer, Tom, to go back to point A. And she would know. Be a ghost from the past, then I would be a ghost from the future. We're neither of us ghosts, nor is the garden. What are you talking about, ghosts, gardens? Suppose someone really had stepped out of one time into another. That would be proof. Proof. <sighs> I have been able to explain very little. If you have not understood the the, the proof in, in matters of time, I'm sure that's all been proof. a very helpful answer to Tom's question, <clears throat> hasn't it, Tom dear? What? Oh yes. Thank you, Uncle Alan. Hattie tried to explain about the words on the clock, and Uncle Alan tried to explain time to me, but I still don't really understand. When I go into the garden tonight, I don't know if I'll be in the same bit of Hattie's time or a different bit, and if it's a different bit, I don't know if it'll be an earlier bit or a later bit. Time no longer. It's still winter, but is this the same winter? Huh? The river's frozen. Skaters. Hattie. 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 Hattie, it's Tom. What's the matter? Can't, can't you see me anymore? Hattie. Hattie. In episode three of Tom's Midnight Garden by Philippa Pierce, the cast was Tom, Peter England, Aunt Gwen, Una Stubbs, Uncle Alan, Crawford Logan, Hattie, Deborah Berlin, Abel, Callum McPherson, Aunt Grace, Judy Parkin, James, Tim Godwin, and Peter, George Miller. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Tom's Midnight Garden was dramatised by Judy Allen, with music by Elizabeth Parker, and directed by John Taylor. While staying with his aunt and uncle, Tom Long has discovered a mysterious garden and made friends with Hattie, one of its inhabitants. But while days pass for Tom, years pass for Hattie, and Tom begins to fear that he will lose her friendship. Tom's Midnight Garden, by Philippa Pierce, dramatized for radio by Judy Allen. Episode 4 Hattie! Hattie, it's me! Tom! Tom! Oh, is that really you? I thought you were a trick of the frost light. <laughs> it's all ice. Just the river right across the meadow. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Well, they've made a gate in the hedge. That's new. That was done a long time ago. Oh, Tom, I am so glad to see you. I miss you sometimes, even now. In spite of the Chapman girls being good fun, and Barty and the others. In spite of the skating. Oh, Tom, skating. I feel as if I could go from here to the end of the world. If all the world were ice. I feel as free as a bird. Oh. Why haven't you any skates? Oh, yes, why haven't I? Hattie, listen. Where do you keep your skates when you're not using them? In the boot cupboard in the hall. Oh, that cupboard's not there anymore. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, not now. Uh, never mind. Hattie, 
Will you promise me something? What is it? You have to promise before I tell you. Well, I can't if it's wrong or dangerous. It isn't either. But you must promise first. Because when I tell you what it is, you may think it's silly. And it isn't, really, it isn't. No, Tom. You must tell me first. Right then. I want you to keep your skates, always, when you're not using them, in that secret place you showed me. You remember? In your bedroom cupboard under the floorboards. There? <laughs> but that is silly. It only seems silly. But there's no harm in it. Oh, please, Hattie, please. But why? It's difficult to explain. But I want you to promise, on your honour, to keep them in that secret place. It is still secret, isn't it? You're the only person I've ever told. I don't understand, but all right, I promise. On my honour. Thank you. I have to go now. Tom, wait! That promise means I should have to leave the skates behind altogether if I went away from here. I have to go back and see if it's worked. But Tom! Tom, is that you? Are you out of bed? Um, I, I've just been to the lavatory. All right, dear. Good night. To whomever may find this, th these skates are the property of Harriet Melbourne, but she leaves them in this place in fulfilment of a promise she once made. You'll have to finish your drawing tomorrow, Tom. It's time for bed now. <sighs> All right. I'll come in and say good night in a few minutes. He's always very good about going to bed. Yes. He's a funny boy. All he ever draws are clocks. However much time I spend in the garden, I don't spend a single second of ordinary time. That's what the clock means when it strikes 13. The hours after the 12th don't exist in ordinary time. So I can go in the garden tonight and stay for months, and time here will stand still at Thursday night and wait for me. Then I can go again on Friday night and stay even longer. I've come to put your light out, Tom, dear. I must finish my letter to Peter. It's time for sleep now. The letter can't be posted until tomorrow anyway. But I didn't send a letter yesterday either. Never mind. I promise to write every day. It's not good to break a promise, but luckily it won't matter to Peter. He'll be seeing you the day after tomorrow anyway. Good night. <sighs> Sorry, Pete. Peter? Why is your light still on? It's late. I can't sleep. I didn't get my letter from Tom today. Oh, he'll be home very soon. Don't you worry about it. Now close your eyes and you'll soon be asleep. Oh. How can I sleep when I haven't got stories of the garden to think about? I haven't even got any letters. I had to burn them all. All I've got is the postcard of Ely Cathedral. Peter, I'm sorry I didn't write you today. I will write tomorrow. Then I'll be able to tell you if I can really skate on Hattie's skates. Tom? Hattie! I thought you'd be out in the garden. I wasn't sure if it was you or a shadow. Oh, of course it's me! Is it still winter? <sighs> yes, it is. James will be down in a minute. It's his turn to drive into market in Castleford, and he's taking me and the trap with him. 
He doesn't know that I mean to skate this afternoon. I mean to skate from Castleford right down to Ely. Can you? Well, of course, it really isn't quite ladylike, so I mustn't tell anyone. Look, I have my skates hidden in my muff. It's the same skates. Uh, but I meant, is the river really frozen over? Frozen so hard. Abel's grandfather says this is one of the hardest, longest frosts he's ever known. The river here is too near the source for the ice to be safe, but below Castleford and all through the fens... Tom, come with me. You will, won't you? That's why you brought your skates. Now? Without going into the garden at all? Oh, the garden will always be there. But this great frost... Well, Cousin Hattie, are you ready? Yes, James. I'm ready. It always is on market day. You should come into town more often, Hattie. Yes. Uh, this will do. I'd like to get out here, please, James. Do you want to lift back later? Oh, thank you, James, but oh, I don't quite know when I shall be ready to return. Well, there's always a train, though it's something of a walk from the station to the house. <laughs> I shall be all right. Do you know the train times? Yes. Don't fuss. Goodbye, James. Hot breffles. Enjoy the shops. I've never ridden behind a horse before. <laughs> Did you enjoy it? Come on, Tom. The river's this way. <laughs> the river is so crowded. There must be more people on the ice than at the market. Oh, come. We can sit here and put on our skates. <sighs> Do you see those gentlemen right over there? In the top hats? Yes. You see how they're moving? In loops and circles. That's called figure skating. It's a very new fashion. Oh, there's a policeman. <laughs> I've never seen a policeman on skates before. He looks like a navy blue duck. <laughs> <laughs> there are some very good skaters here. But I don't expect any are going as far as we are. <laughs> and it really is safe. Oh, yes. This frost is all over England. On some waters, oxen have been roasted whole. Do you know, on the Cherwell at Oxford, a coat with six horses was driven down the middle of the frozen river. The truest and greatest and best use of ice is skating. There. Are you ready? I'm ready. <sighs> We'd better not skate with linked hands as others do with their partners. I think it would look strange as one of us is invisible. <laughs> <laughs> I can skate as well as you. You're keeping up. That's good. It must be because I have your skates. Whew. We've left most people behind now. Not many will skate as far as we will. Would you like me to skate with you for company? Would you like a companion? I have a companion, even if you cannot see him. <laughs> The sun is so low. Look how black my shadow is on the ice. Just one shadow. Oh, look, Tom. The tower of Ely Cathedral. Oh, we've done it. Oh, not yet. There's still a long way away. Shall we go to the cathedral when we get there? Oh, yes. And can we climb the tower? <laughs> I expect so. Yes. <laughs> I've never seen a cathedral before. I never thought there was anywhere so big, so beautiful. Look at the windows. Oh, look at all of these. Oh, yes. Memorials to people who have died. Uh, Mr. Robinson, gentleman of the city, exchanged time for eternity on the 15th day of October, 1812. Exchange time for eternity. Hattie, that's the doorway to the tower. Can we go up? I'll ask. Um, excuse me, is it possible to go to the top of the tower? 
We are about to make the last ascent of the day, young lady. Uh, the charge is sixpence. Come on, Tom. We are to climb the stairs now. Peter, I'm climbing the tower at last. There are so many steps. I've counted to 273 already, and there are more to come. After you, young lady. 274, 275, 76, 77, 76, 77, I always go to sleep if I count. Why isn't it working? I keep seeing that picture of the cathedral. Can't see the garden. 279. I want to think of the garden on the top. Huh? Can't see the car. Picture of the cathedral. 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 280, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86. Oh, we're there. Oh, Tom. We're so high up. I can see forever. There is the River Pools, and in that direction you may see the spires of Castleford. The sunset on the ice the makes it look like you fire. Will follow me. You can get some death this way, Tom. Here. Tom. Tom. Who's that? Peter. How did you get here? But Tom, where are we? Where's the garden? I thought you'd be with Hattie in the garden. Mm. The garden's back there. But Hattie's here. Where? I can't see her. There! On the other side of the tower. The one carrying skates. But that's not Hattie. Go down that's again, a grown-up woman. Please, ladies and gentlemen. I don't understand. She can't be Hattie. She's grown up. She's grown up. She's grown up. She's grown up. Peter, don't fade away. Stay here. Peter! Tom. Who was he? What was he? He was like you. And he was unreal looking, like you. It, it, it was my brother Peter. But he is real, Hattie. And I'm real too. And you really are grown up. <clears throat> Come along, young lady. Don't you want to go home tonight? Yes, it's late. We must hurry. We? It's you should hurry. I've been waiting for you. Come along. Take my hand. Uh, where are you off to at this time of the evening? I'm skating home. Oh, you shouldn't be skating alone. Especially not on this thin ice. The horse and gig is waiting just through the trees. See the light from the lamps? Well, please allow me to give you a lift. Thank you, Barty. This is very kind of you, Barty, but I'm afraid I'm taking you out of your way. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, I've noticed lately that you skate as well as your cousin James. Oh, thank you. Few ladies have skated so far as you did today. Oh, Barty, I love it so. Hattie, can we go back in the garden when we get... My own mother once skated from Castleford to Ely and beyond, but she was in the company of my father. I had heard there were other great thrusts in the past. A thaw's beginning tonight, but they say it'll freeze again. Before the end of winter. Hattie, oh, I do you. hope you will, Barty. Perhaps next time you go to Ely, we can make up a party for the adventure. Oh, yes. Hattie, you're looking right through me. Alan, the flat door is open. What? It's wet with one of Tom's slippers. Is he not in his room? I shall have a word about this. Alan, no. You must have been sleepwalking. We mustn't startle him. Let me... <sighs> yes, all right. Tom, dear? Time to wake up? No. Oh, no, not this time. I don't want it to be now. Tom? 
You're safe. Have you been in a nightmare? It's all right. It's over now. Perhaps it's because I went to sleep in the gig. You're still half asleep. Here we are on Friday morning and tomorrow you're going home. We'll go shopping today and you can choose some little presents for your mother and father and Peter. That'll be nice, won't it? Yes, all right. Tonight is my last chance. You didn't strike 13, but I've come anyway. It has to work tonight. It's my last chance. You understand, don't you? I want to exchange my time for an eternity of Hattie's. Time in the garden can go back. She may be a little girl again tonight and we can play. It's so dark tonight, but I know the garden well enough. He was in the backyard. He must have woken the whole house. Put him on the bed. <clears throat> I'll sit with him until he calms down. <sighs> he had this ancient pair of skates with him. They don't look as if they've been used for, well, 50 or 100 years. Where can he have got them? Alan, you mustn't question him, not even in the morning. Well, I'd like to know. But promise me, he's not fit enough to be worried. <sighs> ah, you may be right. Oh, I'd better put them with his things to go home tomorrow. When he called out, it sounded from up here as though he called someone's name. No, I don't think so. I think he just screamed. Oh, I must go and explain to the other tenants. Reassure them there's no calls for alarm. <laughs> Tom, dear, you can't go home today by train in this state. Now, who is that? So, Tom, your uncle is going to drive you. All right. Tom, can't you tell me what the matter is? You wouldn't believe me. I'm sure I should if you told me the truth. Please, Tom, try. It's the garden. I've lost it. Tom? It's too complicated. That was old Mrs. Bartholomew again. She was very agitated last night when I went up to apologise for the disturbance. Thought I'd succeeded in calming her, but it seems not. <sighs> Why can't she let well enough alone? What does she want just now? Well, she's still insisting that Tom go to her and apologise himself. I shouldn't dream of sending him. Well, certainly not. I told her as much. <laughs> she need not think she could intimidate me. I'll go. Oh. I shan't let you, Tom. No, Tom. I shall go upstairs again myself and take your apologies for you. I'll go. I expect I ought to. I don't mind. Yes? I've come to say I'm sorry. Your name's Tom, isn't it? Your uncle mentioned it. What's your other name? Long. I've come to apologise. Tom Long. So you are a real flesh and blood boy, the Kitson's nephew. And in the middle of last night, you screamed out. You woke me. I've said I'm sorry. I can hardly believe you're really here. Don't you understand? Don't you know who I am? You're Mrs. Bartholomew. You called to me last night. You called my name. Come in, Tom. I should go downstairs. My uncle's driving me home. Come in. Come inside. Isn't that the barometer from the Melbourne's Hall? Come into the sitting room. I'll show you something. Look, look at the photograph over the mantelpiece. That's young Barty. Yes, a likeness taken soon after we were married. Young Barty was Mr. Bartholomew. That's right. You married young Barty. Who were you? I've been telling you, I'm Hattie. No, no, Hattie was alive when Queen Victoria reigned. I worked it out. That's right. I was born towards the end of the Queen's reign. She was an old lady 
When I was a girl, I'm a late Victorian. I don't understand. What happened after the day I skated at Ely with Hattie? The last time we saw each other. That wasn't the last time I saw you. I see you don't know all of our story. It was in 1895 that you and I skated all the way to Ealing, the year of the famous Great Frost. Yes, I remember that. Barty drove us back. Hattie talked to him all the time. She took no notice of me. You were getting thinner. Thinner through. Every winter that I saw you, during the drive home, you faded. And by the time we got back into the house, you'd vanished altogether. <laughs> you were Hattie. You are Hattie. Harriet Melbourne. <laughs> now Harriet Bartholomew. You weren't a ghost. Oh, Hattie. <laughs> yes, Tom. Can you imagine how pleased Aunt Melbourne was when I accepted Barty's proposal? <laughs> she was horrible. She was delighted to get me off her hands. I was married on Midsummer Day. A year or so after the great frost. Oh, Tom, I remember a terrible storm the night before my wedding. I couldn't sleep. I looked out of my window and thought of all I would be leaving behind me, and of my childhood, and the time I'd spent with you. And that was the last time I saw you, down there in the garden. You were as thin through as a piece of moonshine. When? I never saw you looking out of a window. You didn't look up. And then, do you remember the tall fir tree? When the storm was at its worst, the lightning struck it. I remember. Oh, Tom, it was so terrible to see the lightning struck and it fell. I heard you call out. That was when I knew the garden was changing all the time. Because nothing stands still, except in our memory. No, it's all different now. It is. But I forgot the tree and the garden. And I forgot you too, because it was my wedding day. Barty and I went to live on one of his father's farms in the Fens. We were very happy. So when did you come back to this house? Not for a long time. When Aunt Melbourne died, then the family business began to fail, and James sold off the house. Barty bought the house and some of the furniture for me especially the grandfather clock. When I was a child, I loved to hear it striking. I loved the way it chimed, whichever hour it chose. I still do. So do I. And then you moved in here? Not then. No, Barty said it was not a gentleman's house with no garden, so he made it into flats and let them. But you couldn't take the grandfather clock away, could you? It couldn't be moved. That's right. It remained here. Barty and I had two sons, both killed in the Great War. Oh, Hattie. It's all right, Tom. I did all my crying for them a long time ago. Then, many years later, Barty died, and I was left alone. That's when I came to live here. And since you've come to live here, you've often gone back in time, into the past. When you are my age, Tom, you live in the past a great deal. You remember it. You dream of it. That's why the weather in the garden was usually so perfect. And why time sometimes jumped ahead and then sometimes went backwards. It all depended on your dreams. But Tom, never before this summer have I dreamed of the garden so often. And never before have I remembered so clearly what it felt like to be a little Hattie and to be longing and longing for someone to play with. And I was longing for someone to play with too. That must be how it worked. That must be why we were able to go together to the same garden. Last night, when I opened the door, the garden wasn't there anymore. That's why I screamed out. I called to you, but I never thought you could hear me. I knew it was Tom calling for help, but I didn't understand then. I didn't believe you were real until I saw you at my door, just now. We're both real, then and now. It's as the angel said, time, time no, no longer. longer. What happened to Abel? He married Susan, and they had a big family. 
They were very happy. Abel was the only person in the garden who could see me, <laughs> apart from you. Fancy, Aunt Melbourne was always so scornful of Abel. She said he was as stupid as the geese. <laughs> well, the geese could see me, and she couldn't. What about that brother of yours? I saw him in Ely. I've forgotten his name. Peter. I write to him about the garden and playing with you out there. He loves to hear about it. He wishes he could be there too. You must bring him to visit me one day. Will you do that? Yes, thank you. When I get home, I'll be able to tell him the secret of the garden and take him an invitation from Hattie. <laughs> That means it's noon. I don't want to go, but I ought to. I'm to be driven home after lunch. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Bartholomew. Uh, Tom, I was just coming to fetch you. Goodbye, Mrs. Bartholomew. Uh, thank you for the cake. I look forward to our meeting again. <laughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> And Cousin James says I must do other things besides falling out of trees in the future. Things without me? Oh no, Tom. Whenever you want to come, so you shall. Tom will be settled in at home by now. Mm. The flat seems surprisingly empty. You know, Alan, I watched him saying goodbye to Mrs. Bartholomew. Of course, she's such a shrunken little old woman, she's hardly bigger than Tom anyway, but, you know, he put his arms right round her and hugged her goodbye. Just as if she were a little girl. In Tom's Midnight Garden by Philippa Pierce, the cast was Tom, Peter England, Mrs. Bartholomew, Rachel Kempson, Aunt Gwen, Una Stubbs, Uncle Alan, Crawford Logan, Hattie, Deborah Berlin, Barty, Simon J. Williamson, Mrs. Long, Judy Parkin, James, Tim Godwin, Verger, David Holt, and Peter, George Miller. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Tom's Midnight Garden was dramatised by Judy Allen, with music by Elizabeth Parker, and directed by John Taylor.